Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, this workshop is called More Memory Tricks, and I know some of you were here last week at the regular Memory Tricks. If you weren't, you'll be able to catch on to this, I think, very quickly anyway, but I have so many memory tricks that it's hard to uh, cover them all in one workshop, so we're going for two. Uh, these are the four things that I'm going to talk to you about today. This one is really quick, and then we're going to spend a lot of time on these uh, next couple. Um, last week, for those who were here, one thing that you should remember is that um, I taught a couple of math tricks at the beginning of the workshop, and that was not designed to teach math. It was designed to just show you the power of tricks and knowing shortcut ways to do things. And so uh, I'm going to show you one more math trick uh, now as just a little warm up. This is nothing you need to write down or anything, but again, it's to show you something about, again, the power of tricks. So if I asked you to do a problem, like that, 9 divided by 0.25. What you would need to do in order to solve that would be to do this, and then this, and then you'd have to move the decimal point over and just do the whole thing. If you know the basics of how to do it, it's not that hard. It just takes a little while to kind of process through. But if you know the trick, you can do it in about one second without having to do any of this, and that is, Whenever you have a math problem where you have a number divided by 0.25, that's the exact same as multiplying it by 4, which is a lot easier than the other. So here's your math question for the day. What's 9 times 4? 36. Okay, and if you had done all of this and all of that and done it, you would have come up with the same answer. It would have just taken you a lot longer. And so 6 divided by 0.25 would be... 24, right? 6 times 4. And the fact that you can do that once you learn this in about one second doesn't mean that you're any smarter than you were when you came in here in math. It just means that you know the shortcut, again, the trick. And so the goal of last week's workshop and this week is to show you some applications of how you can use tricks to make your memory absorb more and do better on tests as a result. And that's what these three are going to be all about. Okay, so whether you follow that completely or not doesn't particularly matter for our purposes today. But what I wanted to do first in terms of uh, an actual teaching has to do with mental pictures. And a uh, quick uh, recap for those who were not here last week just so that you have an idea of what we're doing. I explained last week that one of the best memory tricks you could have is learning how to close your eyes and getting a picture of something in a certain way and then it sticks. It kind of glues into your brain and you remember it. All of us have imagination. All of us can close our eyes and see things. But two of the qualities of a good mental picture that I gave last time that you need to be aware of for what we're about to do right now is that if the pictures are really stupid and bizarre, you remember them better. And so everything I'm about to do with you is going to seem to be pretty stupid and that usually sounds bad, but in this case, it's going to be good, and I'll show you. The other one is that you very often have to involve play on words, which means rhyming words, other words that sound similar to be able to see things in picture form. And again, I'm going to show you specifically how to do this, this now. Now, if you are very tired today, I'm extremely nervous about what's going to happen in the next couple of minutes because I'm going to ask you several times to close your eyes and get a picture of something that I'm describing. And I want you to do that. I don't want you to just sit there and kind of stare at me. I want you to close your eyes. But then when I'm done, you need to open them. And so if you're really tired, I don't want to hear snoring anywhere in the room. So hopefully we'll be okay with this. What I'm going to teach you is going to actually require no note taking whatsoever. So usually I like people to write down some things that I teach that they find helpful. But for the next five minutes or so, I don't want you to write anything down. It kind of defeats the purpose of this. I'm going to teach you something that I'm going to test you on at the end of the workshop. And I think if you do this the right way, you're going to be shocked at how easy it is for you to memorize what I'm about to show you without writing it down, without doing anything like that at all. So again, I want you to just um, follow my direction. And when I have you close your eyes, I want you to close your eyes. And the big thing, remember, is I don't want you to try 
to close your eyes and listen and remember what I'm saying because you won't. I want you to see the pictures that I'm describing and if you see them clearly, you're going to remember them later. Okay, so here is the, the strange little teaching here. I'm going to teach you 12 names of streets that are all in the Long Beach area. You'll probably recognize most of these streets. Three of them are in group A, three in B, three in C, and three in D. When I give you a test at the end of the workshop, what I'm going to expect you to do is when I give you the name of a street, I expect you to know which group it's in. And a lot of times when you have many things to learn, it's easy to get them mixed up and in the wrong groups. But if you do this right, you're going to be perfect at the end and sort of surprised again how well this worked. So here's the first uh, picture, okay? We're going to end up with several pictures here. We're going to use the sound alike word hay. Okay, everybody I think knows what hay looks like, whether it's a big bale of hay or like loose hay or straw. That's a picture I want you to get. And I have a little visual aid here just to kind of make this a little bit even easier for you. The first street in group A is this one, which is market. Okay, so this is the first part of the first scene. And again, just follow me with this. Even if it seems weird, you'll find in the end it works. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to get a picture of the market, the supermarket. And you're walking down the aisle with your cart shopping. But everywhere you look, on the left and the right, on the floor in front of you, there's hay sticking off the shelves, bales of hay in front of you. You have to even swerve your cart around. So I want you to really see that. Again, don't just listen to the words, but try to get that picture in your mind. Okay? Now, you can open your eyes. I'm going to show you something, because otherwise you wouldn't get this. Uh, as you're going down the aisle, all these people are there. Nothing unusual about that, except they're not shopping. They're standing there, kind of blocking your way. And every person you're looking at has something in front of their face. You can't really see their face at all. And what they have, what they're doing is they're reading magazines while they're standing there in the market. Well, go ahead and close your eyes. And this is where I want your imagination to work. I want you to imagine all these people in front of you standing there reading magazines and I want you to even read the cover of the magazine. In other words, what magazine is it that they're reading? Really be specific about it because that helps. So kind of get that picture in your mind. Okay, and then you can open your eyes and what street is that supposed to help you remember? Well, this is one of these weird tricks that actually works. It may sound a little bit odd. It's for this one, Magnolia. What does that have to do with what I just described? Well, just this part, the mag as in magazines. Um, if I asked you to close your eyes and get a picture of a magnolia tree, could you do that? Uh, maybe a few of you, but I have no idea what that looks like, so I can't really get a picture of it, but a magazine, that I know, right? So we stick with things that we know. Okay, and then go ahead and close your eyes one more time for this weird picture. You get very angry with all these people in front of you and you finally say, could you move out of the way? I have to go through and shop. And I want you to imagine every person who has those magazines in front of them lowering the magazine and looking at you. And now you can see them, but in place of their eyes, picture big red cherries right in place of their eyeballs. And imagine as you look at each person what it would look like to see cherries stuck there. Okay, and then you can open your eyes and that street, if you can't figure out we're in trouble, that's a simple one, all right? So this one is easy, some are a little bit harder. Okay, now that picture, that weird little picture with the hay in the market is supposed to connect all those together and we'll see how that goes later. The second uh, category, we're going to use the letter or the, um, the insect, the bee. Everybody knows what a bee looks like, but don't picture a bee that's like this. Picture one that's the same size you are. That would get your attention in a hurry with the big stinger. So five or six foot B coming after you. Okay, the first street in group B is this one, and that is park. Okay, so here is a new strange picture I want you to get. Go ahead and close your eyes, and hopefully you're not falling asleep on me with this. Close your eyes and imagine yourself standing in the park in the playground area where the swings and the slides are. And everywhere you walk in the park, there's this giant bee that is trying to buzz by and, and sting you. Kind of get that image in your mind. Okay, and then go ahead and keep your eyes closed. 
you look around the park and there's nobody there. You're all alone except for the bee. And you decide, I haven't gone down a slide since I was a kid and nobody's here to look at me, so I'm going to try it again. And so I'm, imagine yourself climbing up the ladder to the top of the slide, but you're in for a shock. When you get to the top of the slide, you see a man sitting up there. You didn't see him before, but there he is. He's dressed in red, bright red. He has a big white beard and he has big black belt. Okay, who are we talking about? Santa. Yeah, Santa Claus. Well, what street is that? Okay, this is another one of those partial ones that still works, okay? And so if you weren't sure who I was talking about, go ahead and close your eyes back up and again imagine Santa up on top of the slide and then you can keep your eyes closed for the last little part of this and that is he sits up there and you're waiting and he doesn't go down so you shove him down the slide and now it's your turn and I want you to imagine sitting at the top of a slide even if it's been a long time since you've done this and as you drop down feel what it feels like in your stomach and all of that as you drop but also as you're going down the slide I want you to imagine on the left and right side of the slide are beautiful pink roses that are lining the slide you can even kind of feel them as you're sliding down so see that picture kind of connected in your brain okay and then you can open your eyes and that one which should again be an easier one is this is rose okay quick review so far where is all the hay in the market. Uh, what is this? Cherry. Cherry. And again, if somebody uh, walked in right now, they'd think, what in the world are you talking about? What is this? Magazine. Yeah, magazine. And if that's all you said, that's good. Okay, what's it supposed to be? Magnolia. Yeah, magnolia. But who cares? As long as you got that part, you're fine. Um, what is buzzing around the, bee, or the uh, park? Bee. The bee. And what's on the sides of the slide? Roses. Who's up at the top? Santa. Santa. Faye. Yeah, Santa Claus, right? Okay, so we've got two bizarre little scenes or pictures. The third one is the weirdest one of all, so that means you're going to remember this one for sure. We're going to use the sea, the ocean, because you can get and see a picture of that. So uh, this image is not the most enjoyable, but I want you to try to get it anyway. I want you to try to close your eyes and imagine this. You have fallen overboard off of a ship, and the ship is gone. And you are alone in the cold water, treading water, trying to stay afloat. And you're afraid that the sharks are going to come get you. And you're looking around, wondering what you're going to do. And all of a sudden, I want you to get this image. You look to your left and right and straight ahead of you, and you see hundreds of these little round objects bobbing up and down on the water. And you think, what are those? And you swim over and grab one and look at it. It's an orange. I have no idea what they're doing there, but there are hundreds of oranges on the sea, okay? So see that clearly, okay? And then you can open your eyes, and I don't even need to show this to you, but I will anyway. That is street number one, okay? Here's the stupidest one of all. I love this because it's so dumb that you're going to remember it. Close your eyes back up, and here's the image. You're afraid, you're cold, you're treading water, you're holding an orange, and all of a sudden, all these animals start swimming at you from all angles with their mouths open, ready to attack you which is what you were afraid of, except they're not sharks. In fact, you're so upset you start screaming out in Spanish. <laughs> and what do you shout? Well, you can look up here, and this is what you shout. Okay, los coyotes, they're coming. If you don't know what a coyote looks like, you could picture a wolf or anything else, but I want you to get the idea of really wet, angry coyotes swimming from all angles. So close your eyes back up and see that, and then the last little part of this picture is this. Just when you think you have no hope whatsoever, a miracle occurs. You hear the honking of a horn, and you look off to the side, and there's a car speeding full speed toward you. It can be any car you want. Whatever is your favorite car, go ahead and make it that. And that car pulls right up next to you, door opens, the person in there pulls you out and saves you at the last second. So I want you to see that weird thing, get all of this on the sea. Okay? Um, anybody have an idea what street that is? That would be a good guess too. Yeah, it's right there. I forgot where, which way we're pointing here. Yeah, it's car Done. Okay, so that's one of those part things again. Okay, um, who's at the top of the slide? Santa, Santa Claus or Faye. Uh, what's on the sides of the slide? Roses. Where are you? 
in the park and what is trying to attack you? The bee, okay? On the sea, what's trying to attack you? Go. Los Coyotes. Uh, what comes to your rescue on the sea? Car, son. And what do you see bobbing up and down all over the place? Oranges, okay? Um, what is all over the market everywhere you look? Okay, and what's everybody doing? They're reading magazines. And what is this again? Cherry. Cherry. Okay, now, we are done with three. We have one more to go, and I want to see if you can figure this out. There are three more streets. I want you to know them, okay, but I'm not going to teach them to you. So the question is, how can you possibly know something if I don't teach it to you? Well, um, here's what we're doing. You have three uh, pictures, weird ones, that are stuck in your brain, and hopefully they won't disappear. <clears throat> if I ask you on the test that I give you in about like 20, 25 minutes, if I ask you uh, what category is the street Del Amo in, then what's the answer? D. Yeah, D. How do you know that? Yeah, because it's not an A or B or C. So when I give you those three, you're going to look at me and think, you never... Uh, and then you'll get them. These will be the easiest ones. And so it's like you know something without ever learning it. It's kind of a, another shortcut. So what I'm going to ask you to do, I hope you can't do this, but hope, uh, hopefully we'll make an effort at it. And that is, I want you to forget everything I just taught you. Just completely disappear. I'm going to teach you two more things, and then we're going to go back at the end, and I'm going to see how well you remember what I just taught you. So let it go and move on from there, okay? Um, we're going to talk for a little while about the subject of definitions. And uh, there are some classes in college where this is one of the main things you do, is to memorize a whole bunch of definitions or vocabulary. Uh, in an earlier workshop, I talked about sort of good ways and bad ways that people try to go about remembering them. But for our purposes today, since the subject is tricks, I'm going to teach you a trick way to remember definitions. This doesn't work with all definitions, but when it works, when it's a good fit, it's the best trick I know for it. And so um, what this is called, and this always sounds sort of um, complicated to people, but it's not at all, is it's called the similar sound cue technique. Okay, and one of the main reasons that I like this, besides the fact that it works, is that there are only two steps. Two steps sounds really good. It's a lot better than 10 steps or whatever. And even better than that, the two steps are actually in the name of the method. So that makes it really easy to remember. The first step is the similar sound, and the second step is the Q part. And of course, that doesn't help you any right now, but when I show you how this works, you'll realize how simple it is. Um, I'm going to write a word up here. Let me do this in red so it might be a little easier to pick up. Um, this is a word that probably nobody in here knows. If somehow you do, don't mention it for right now. This is a very long word. It doesn't even look like English in a way. And if you had a definition to learn of this word, what you might do is what most people do. Grab a flashcard, write the word on one side and the definition on the other, and practice them. But you're going to see in just a minute how confusing that would be and why this works better. So um, the way that you start this is by doing the similar sound step. And usually that takes five seconds or 10 seconds. So what you do, and this is what we're going to look at here, is you look at the word you're trying to learn. And the first thing you do is try to see if there's any part of the word that you already know. Sometimes there will be, sometimes there won't. In this case, I think we're all good for part of this. What is that? Phobia. Yeah, phobia. And what's a phobia? Yeah, it's a fear, and it's an extra large kind of irrational fear, not a normal type fear. Um, arachnophobia is fear of spiders, right? So most people, when it comes to spiders, uh, they don't go up to them when they see them crawling and just watch them and say, oh, that's really cute. They just kind of jump a little, and then they take care of it whatever way they do. But if you suffer from arachnophobia, you're terrified to the point where you almost have a heart attack when you see one. So again, that's what these are. So these are very serious conditions. A lot of people struggle with phobias. And so this that we're looking at here is the fear of something. But this doesn't look familiar at all. And so what you do is you say a part of the word that you don't know. And this is what we're going to focus on here. You say it out loud to yourself a few times, 
and listen and come up with a word you know that sounds similar to this, which you don't. Okay, so this is pronounced keranophobia. Keranophobia. So when you look at this, and I'm going to ask you for a little help on this, when you hear keran, 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 what does that sound like? Quran, Quran the, the Muslim holy book? Yeah, yeah, so a lot of people hear keran and they say Quran. That's very similar, so that's a good one. What else besides that? Keran. Crayon. Crayon, that's good. I've had people say uh, carry on. Uh, other people have said the one that I'm actually going to show you because it's on a handout that I'm going to give you in a minute. And this is a good one too. Those that you gave are fine. But it's also similar to the woman's name, Karen. So you have Karan, Karen, right? Similar. So you play with the sound of that, that part of the word, and then you come up with something that you know that sounds similar to that, and then you're halfway done already. The other part <coughs> is the Q part. And to do the Q part, what you do is take that word that you just came up with and make a little sentence that includes it, a very short, simple sentence that's supposed to help you memorize the <coughs> definition. So the example here is the Q sentence is Karen is afraid of, and then here comes the meaning of this. I think a lot of you are going to be surprised at this because this is not a very common phobia, but it's a real one. Some people are terrified of this, and that is lightning. Okay, so flashes of lightning, not lighting, but lightning, right? And so if you uh, memorize this by writing keranophobia on one side and fear of lightning on the back, it would be really hard for you to lock that in your brain because this doesn't look like this. It doesn't sound like this. There's just no way to connect them. I always wonder when I do this, why they didn't just call it lightningophobia? And then we'd all be fine, right? We wouldn't have to make a trick. But this trick, which everybody here has already memorized, because it's really simple, here's what happens. You go to your psychology test. It's probably the class where you would get a bunch of phobias to learn. And you've studied them this way. And you see a, a question on there that says, keranophobia is the fear of, and then gives you four choices. You see this word, and what's the first thing you think of? Karen. You think of poor Karen. And you know that she's afraid of lightning, so you mark lightning. How about if the teacher asks it the other way? Teachers change wording all the time. So how about if the teacher said, which of the following is the fear of lightning? And then they gave you four phobias. Well, you see lightning, you think of poor Karen, and then you think of, you find Karenophobia, and you mark it. So instead of just being this weird word that you're not familiar with, it's something very easy to hold on to. Okay, and so that's the concept of this. Now, there's one more that I want to show you, um, and then I'll give you a handout, and we'll kind of go through several. Um, I want you to help me with this, okay? This is a real phobia that a lot of people have. It's a very common one, but when you look at this, it's not going to help you at all. So I'm going to ask you to guess, and you're going to be wrong. I'm just telling you before you start, but I want you to guess anyway. Based on this, the way it looks or the way it sounds, and I'll pronounce it in a minute, I want you to guess what this might be the fear of. So this is pronounced belonephobia. Belonephobia. So what would your guess be? Yeah, the, the, one of the most common ones is fear of bologna, you know, lunch meats ah, and all that, and that's not it. If it had been fear of baloney, we wouldn't even need to do that, right? Because it would be easy. What else does it look like or sound like? Fear of being alone. That looks really good, right? Not even close. Okay. Again, if it had been that, we wouldn't need any help. Well, this, I've even had people say fear of balloons fear of bells, fear of the number one, you know, they're just like guessing all kinds of things. None of those even close. What this is, and I would bet that somebody in here either struggles with this or you know somebody who does. It's that common. Uh, Balonophobia is the fear of needles, as in getting a shot, getting blood drawn. Some people are so terrified of that, they almost have a heart attack whenever the needle is coming close at the doctor's office. Well, again, they should call it needleophobia. So if I was in charge of the English language, we'd just change all these, but it's not. How do you connect these two in your brain so that on a test you'd remember it? You do exactly what I showed you here. And so that's what I want to show you now. Uh, when you came in today, 
You didn't know that you were going to be an expert on phobias when you walked out, but you will be, at least on these. There are 10 phobias on this page, and we're just going to look at them for a couple of minutes so that I can show you a lot of good examples of this. So every one of these phobias is real. People think that half of them are made up, but they're not. I think you'll recognize at least a few of these as being very well known because they're common. Okay, and so first one on the list is a very common one, acrophobia, fear of heights. And it says acrobats fear high jumps. Real simple little sentence. Anthrophobia is fear of people. And this is where a play on words was developed by the people who created this. Ant threw the people out. And that's because you have to think of something that sounds like anthro, and there's not much like that. Aerophobia is fear of flying, and it says arrows fly, people shouldn't. There you see coronophobia, which we've done. The next one is also very common, claustrophobia, which is fear of closed or tight places. And I love this sentence. And we have Santa Claus twice in one workshop. That's very weird, but it's Santa Claus hates small chimneys. So if you picture big Santa Claus, trying to squeeze down a tight chimney, that's a good image of what claustrophobia is. And then the next one is my favorite one ever. Ergophobia, fear of work. Her go home, she no like work. Stupid sentence, but again, the more stupid it is, the more you tend to remember it. I bet you won't forget that one. Belonephobia is fear of needles, and there's the little sentence, baloney. The shot will hurt. So we got baloney in there one way or another. Vestophobia is the fear of clothing. I'm not sure how that one works, but it says here, vests and other clothes scare me. Now, why should we probably not need a trick to remember that one? Yeah, because a vest is a type of clothing. So I bet you could remember that one right away, even without that trick, but it's there. The la next to last one is iatrophobia, which is fear of doctors. and the word there, if you're not familiar with it, I atrophy when I see doctors, just means to sort of be paralyzed or unable to be used, that kind of an idea. And then the last one on the list is polyphobia. It's kind of like the one I gave you up here because it's a woman's name. Fear of many things, poly is afraid of almost everything. Okay? Now, what I want to tell you about this, just very briefly, and then we're going to move on to our uh, next topic, is um, I've tried an experiment with some of my classes before that's worked really well, so it's very encouraging. At the very beginning of an hour and 15 minute class, I taught them this method, and then we read through all of these like we just did, and then I gave them about two more minutes to just go back and kind of reread them and soak them in their brain, and then we put them away, and I taught about other things for almost an hour without ever looking at that again, and then at the very end, I went back and tested them to see how well they remembered these. And every time I've done that, almost 100% of all the students in the class got a perfect score, remembered them all. Even though they didn't study them for hours, they didn't make flashcards, they just learned them from me and then looked at them for a couple minutes and then an hour later they were still there. So it shows that this can work. Now, one last little thing about this. You notice how these definitions are very short? If you have a class where you have definitions to learn and the definitions are like three or four sentences long. This isn't gonna work too well unless you can figure out how to take that definition and shrink it down to a few words. This is mostly for shorter, kind of bite-sized definitions, then this works in a fantastic way. I've even had students try this with foreign language because whenever you take a foreign language, you have to learn a lot of vocabulary. And so they come up with a word in French or Spanish or whatever it is, and they have that word and they pronounce it and they try to think of an English word that sort of sounds similar and they do something similar and it works. It doesn't always work for everybody equally, but it's a little trick to try and sometimes it helps everything click better in your mind. Okay, uh, any questions on this? Okay, um, the, let me go ahead and start by the way, sign in sheet. When that uh, sign in sheet gets to you, if you could just keep listening, but sign and keep it moving along, I would appreciate that a lot. Um, the last main teaching before I test you to see how well you remember what I taught you before is related to exact locations. And so my little introduction to this is this way. Um, in some classes in college, you are required to memorize locations of things. Geography is an example where a teacher would give you a blank map and you have to remember where everything goes. But 
the more common one is science classes like a biology class where a teacher would give you a diagram of the heart or something else and you have to label everything and remember exactly where it goes. Well, under the pressure of a test, no matter how long you study that, you have a tendency sometimes to get things mixed up or put them in the wrong place. And so if you know a trick to help with that, it should make it easier. So what I'm going to do is give you a copy of a handout that would be used in a geography class. This is the example that I'm going to give you. And um, I know that you are familiar with what you're going to look at here, some of you probably more than others. But I want you to pretend for what we're about to do that this country whose map you're looking at is a country you have never really seen or studied before. It's somewhere on the other side of the world somewhere and you don't know anything about it. Okay, and so if you had this to memorize, that's a lot, okay? And so one thing I wanna say first is that there are two basic ways a teacher could test you on this material. One would be to have you see if you could remember which states belonged in which regions. So that's one way. The other way, the mean way, would be to give you a blank map and have you just start filling in every part of it. Well, the way you study for those, the way you approach those two ways is kind of different. And so I want to show you something that is actually connected in a way to something I taught last week. One of my main teachings in the um, workshop on memory tricks was about acronyms and acrostics and learning how to use the first letters of words to create other words or sentences that help you remember things. So what I'm going to use as an example for the first part of this is the region idea. How can you remember which states belong in which region? Well, here's the example. I want you to locate the Rocky Mountain region, which you see listed here at the bottom. And of course, you can follow the arrow and you see where it is on the map. If I, as your teacher for geography, expected you to memorize the six states and know that those are the ones in the Rocky Mountain region, you could stare at it. You could look at them a hundred times and try to remember them and hopefully you would. But again, on test day when you're nervous, you have a tendency sometimes to blank out. So here's what we do. If I copy the first letter of every one of those, this is what we end up with. Okay, so those are the first letters. Well, one thing you could do is to try to move these letters around and make a word out of them and then use that to easily remember. But I have never, if you can help me with this, that would be great, but I've never been able to find a word that uses all these letters. It doesn't work. So what I do to remember these without even having to look at the map is I use this very strange sentence, and that is, when I drive in the Rocky Mountain region, my car usually needs ice wipers. And there's no such thing exactly as ice wipers, but you kind of get the idea. My car usually needs ice wipers. That's my little sentence I remember. What is that supposed to help you with? Well, all of these letters are the first letter of one of those states, okay? Now, what I want to do, even though I know you haven't studied this, I want you to take this map, and just for a few seconds, I want you to turn it over so you can't see it, and I want to see how you do with this. Um, what state is this? Montana? Montana. 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 Colorado. Colorado. Utah. Utah. Nevada. 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 Idaho. Idaho and Wyoming. Now, are there other states in the United States that start with these letters? Yes, but you haven't even studied these and you already kind of know a few. And if you studied it a little bit and you practice this, then when the time came for your test and your teacher said, list the six states in the Rocky Mountain region, you just say, my car usually needs ice wipers. And you write all down all these letters and then all the states just come out. And again, it's a very simple way to remember a group of things. Okay, but the bigger challenge, and this is what I want to focus on for the next few minutes, is what do you do if the, the uh, teacher is going to give you a blank map and expect you to remember the exact locations? What would be an easy way to remember those? Well, to do this, I want you to look at the uh, lower right corner of the map at the southeast region. That's a much, much uh, bigger region with many more states. Okay, and so 
as you look and you follow the little arrow up and you see that cluster of states there, what I'm going to do is show you something a little bit like I showed you here, but with a little bit of a twist to it. So um, as you look up into the southeast region, um, as you follow the little arrow and you start in right where I'm pointing here at the kind of lower left corner, you see the letters LA, right? What does that stand for? Louisiana, okay? So we're going to start there and we're going to just use the L, all right? Um, now, if we went from there across and then back and up and over, we'd forget all of that. So we're going to go in a way that's really easy to remember. What state is right above Louisiana? Yeah, right above is Arkansas. Now, w when you see these two letters, LA, what do you think of? Los yeah, Los Angeles. That has nothing to do with that part of the country, but that's okay. We're going to use this in our little trick. Okay, if you go from Arkansas and then you just go straight across the southern border of the United States, what's the next state you come to? Mississippi, then Alabama, then Georgia. Okay, what does this remind you of? Magazine. Yeah, magazine. We already got that sort of from before. Well, this is a really weird coincidence. There's actually a magazine called LA Magazine or Los Angeles Magazine. Again, has nothing to do with that part of the country, but we'll use it as part of our trick. Now, here's a quick question for you. We kind of skipped one, and that was Florida. Why would we not need to include that one in our trick? Yeah, it's recognizable because on any diagram or any map, anything that physically sticks out away from everything else, that's usually really easy to remember just by looking at it once or twice. It's all the stuff buried in the middle that's usually harder. So we're going to just skip that one. Keep going up the coast. What comes after Georgia? South Carolina. South Carolina. So now we have um, plural, LA mags, like LA magazines. Uh, what's next? Yeah, North Carolina. And um, why do we not need to include that one in our trick? Yeah, and I always tell people, if you're in a geography class and you don't know that north is above south, I can't help you, right? So that should be simple. It's like two for one, okay? So we don't need to include north. If we know where south is, we got north. What's next? Straight up is Virginia, okay? Well, you know that Virginia is the name of a woman in addition to being the name of a state. So what we have so far, this strange sentence is, when I'm in the southeast, I buy LA mags for Virginia, which again, doesn't make a lot of sense, but it doesn't matter. It's simple to remember, okay? Well, we're out of coastline now, so go left. What's next after Virginia? Yeah, West Virginia, okay? And we shouldn't need to include that either because, again, you should know that West is left. So that means we've done all the states in that region except for two. Which ones are still left? Kentucky. Yeah, Kentucky and Tennessee. Now, when you create some kind of a memory trick like this, you don't want the trick to be so long that you forget the trick later. So we're going to leave this right here. That's about enough. But I want to ask for your help with this. See how you do, okay? As you look at Kentucky and then Tennessee, it would be easy for a person to remember that those go there. But then when the test came, it would be really simple to get them mixed up, to get them reversed, right? That kind of thing happens all the time. So based on what I taught you at the beginning today about creating weird pictures in your mind to remember things, what could you do to remember that Kentucky is above or on top of Tennessee? So here's what we do. What does this make you think of? First thing, Kentucky. Yeah, most people start getting hungry or whatever. Immediately they say fried chicken. Okay, so we're going to use that. How about Tennessee? What does that sound like or rhyme with or anything? Yeah, a lot of people think of tennis, you know, like tennis shoes, tennis racket, tennis ball. Well, here's what people have told me. So I didn't come up with these. This is even weirder than I could come up with. I've had people say they pictured a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken here and tennis shoes down there. And so Kentucky's up there, Tennessee's down there. It's a very weird picture, but you'll never get them mixed up. Other people have said I pictured eating a piece of chicken and holding a tennis ball down here. 
whatever you come up with, as long as it's sort of creative and weird, it'll stick in your mind. And so by doing these two things, coming up with this and coming up with that Kentucky and Tennessee, if you studied it that way and you just reviewed it a few times and then the teacher gave you a blank map of that part and you knew, okay, I'm starting in the lower left with Louisiana, Arkansas, you'd end up getting every one of them right. And so what a lot of students tell me when I ask them, how do you study for a map test or a diagram test, they say, I just stare at it, open my eyes really wide and stare at it a lot and hope that it soaks in. That's a bad move. And so you want to come up with some creative way, whether it's like this or something else, to be able to remember it under the pressure of a test. Okay, so that's the purpose behind this. Okay, any questions on this one? All right, last thing that we're going to do today is uh, for me to give you your test. Okay, so if you want it on the back of this, or you could do it on notebook paper or whatever, I want you to number from 1 down to 12. From 1 down to 12. And then I'm going to just give you a really quick instruction. And then I'm going to be off and running on this little quiz. And again, um, sometimes when people hear the word test or quiz, they get nervous. Don't get nervous. You're not turning this into me. But we'll see how you do. Okay, I'm going to read all those street names, all mixed up, in a mixed up order. And what I want you to do for each one of them is, this is like regular multiple choice, put down A, B, C, or D as the category that it's in. Take a few seconds and get the picture that this goes with. This one, this one. Remember what I said about this one, and then you're ready, and you should be able to do great. Okay, so again, you're just putting A, B, C, or D. Number one is orange. So if you have to kind of look up there, just think of the pictures and put down the group. Number two, market. Number three, cherry. Number four, exemino. Exemino. Number five, Santa Fe. Number six, Carson. Number seven, Spring. Number eight, Magnolia. Number nine, Studebaker. Number 10, Park. Number 11, hopefully we'll all get this, Los Coyotes. And the last one, number 12, is Rose. Okay, now I'm going to uh, read the correct answers, have you sort of check yours, see how you did, and then I have one more sort of comment to make about this method and then we'll be all set, okay? Here are the answers. Number one is C, 2A, 3A, what was four? D. D, right, so that should have been easy. Number five was B, 6C, 7D, 8A, 9D, 10B, 11C, and 12B. Okay, um, anybody get them all right? But several, how many missed one or two? Okay, so um, if you think about it, the way I taught this to you was very quick, no writing down, with a little bit of review, and then we left it for like 20 or 30 minutes. And then when I went back, it was all still there. The last thing that I wanted to share with you, and I love this little story, is that um, I had, uh, when, when you learn things this way, by, by use of mental pictures, they stick for a long time, longer than you want them to. And I had a student one time, this guy, who uh, learned this from me and told me later that about three months after that day where we did all that, he was driving with a friend and he hadn't thought about any of that ever since that day that he was here in the workshop. And he said he was driving and they stopped at a red light and he looked at the light and he was waiting for it to change and he glanced up and he saw the street and it said, Los Coyotes. 
And immediately, as soon as he saw that, he looked at his friend and he said, hey, that's in group C. And the person looked at him like, what? And he even said, what? Oh, oh, I fell overboard off the boat. I was in the sea. I saw orange. And he was starting to tell the whole story, even though he hadn't thought about it in months. And that shows that it was still there. I may have ruined your driving enjoyment in Long Beach for the rest of your life, but I dare you, the next time you're driving down the street and you look up and you see Cherry or you see Carson, not to have that story flash in your mind. And you're going to say, I want to get rid of it. You can't. It's going to be in there for a long time. And again, some things you don't want in there, but if you apply this to school-related things and then a test comes, you realize, wow, it's there. It hasn't disappeared anywhere, and that's what you want. You want to learn things in such a way that they're glued in there and they'll come out beautifully on a test, okay? That's the goal. Okay, so uh, we're done for the day. If you could pass me the sign-in sheet again.